hello. So, so hopefully you can see me and hear me. So I just want to welcome you all to this latest London Centre for Neglect of Tropical Disease and joint with the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene webinar. So today we're going to be discussing some of the emerging key issues related to schistosomiasis morbidity. And in particular, following the recent launch of the WHO NTD roadmap and also the pending WHO guidelines with the targets to reach, the very ambitious targets to reach elimination as a public health problem by 2030 in all endemic 78 countries. It's critical, we, see to, we need to understand a lot more about what factors, interacting factors may be responsible for many of these persistent hotspots of infection that we occur. So here we're gonna be looking at the morbidity in the human host, and in particular, we're most interested in some of those most neglected aspects of morbidity. So we'll see in the first talk, the role of the infecting parasite species and species combination. Amy will then role of both female and male genital schistosomiasis. Alison is then going to go on to talk about the impact of infection and in pregnancy, again a key critical group that's been very much neglected until now. And last but certainly not least, I'll be introducing as they come along, Brigitte is going to be talking about some of these most severe persistent morbidity that we're seeing hotspots around the Lake Albertine region of Uganda. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the talks and then you put your questions in the chat as we go along. Some will be answered as we go along. The rest at the end will come back and we'll bring all the speakers together and then we'll pose the questions in the open discussion then. And we'll also be sending around a feedback webinar, which would be a feedback document afterwards. It would be really keen for you to answer. So we're going to open now and I'm delighted to open with Dr. Sebastian Lambert, who is a epidemiologist and mathematical modeler based at the Royal Veterinary College with um, Dr. Martin Walker and myself. And he's looking at different aspects, also with the fiber shop program that Brigitte is going to talk about later. But he, here he's going to talk about some of the potential interesting roles about these novel zoonotic hybrids and what differential role they may have on the morbidity of schistosomiasis. So over to Sebastian. Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian. I'm a postdoc at the Royal Veterinary College, working with Martin Walker and Joan Webster. And today I'm going to talk about the differential impact of hybridized, mixed, or single schistosomiasis species infections on human morbidity. Following anthropogenic and environmental changes, uh, the endemic areas of schistosoma mansoni and schistosoma hematobium overlap in many uh, areas in Africa. And this represents opportunities for co-infections between both species in the same individual host. In addition, there is an increased risk of encountering uh, animal schistosome species following anthropogenic changes and increasing movements of humans and animals. And there are now reports of uh, zoonotic hybrids, uh, for example, between hematobium and bovis, which will be the focus of this uh, presentation. Therefore, there is a complex life cycle as an interface between humans and domestic animals, which we are only starting to understand, but the impact of hybrids and morbidity in humans remains unknown. Morbidity induced by schistosomes mainly depends on the egg laying site. So for schistosoma mansoni, the worms migrate to the mesenteric veins, causing the eggs to be trapped in the liver or the spleen, and therefore causing, for example, periportal fibrosis, hepatomegaly, or portal hypertension. For hematobium, the worms migrate to the vesical plexus, leading to bladder lesions, hematuria, and uh, renal and genital lesions. What happens when both species are present in the same host is that the dominant hematobium male divert uh, monsonic females towards the vesical plexus, leading to less eggs uh, in the liver and more eggs in the bladder, 
therefore causing a differential morbidity profile where uh, there is less hepatic morbidity and uh, more bladder morbidity compared to single species infections. For hybrids, a similar process could be uh, expected because of the hybridization between the human urogenital hematobium and the animal uh, intestinal schistosoma bovis. But uh, it's more to, difficult to predict the direction because uh, hybridization is bidirectional. Uh, but we nonetheless expect a differential mobility profile for uh, hybrid infections. To study this question, we had two study sites in Senegal uh, where uh, hybrids between hematobium and bovis are reported. The first is Richarthal, where uh, both hematobium and Montanai are co-endemic. Uh, and the second is Bakety, where Montanai is absent and only hematobium and hybrids are present. We performed two surveys in 2016 and 17 uh, with both school aged children and adults. Um, and all infected individuals were treated with prosecontel and followed up uh, one month after treatment. At both, uh, for both surveys and at both time points, uh, the individuals were sampled for parasitology with uh, catocats and urine filtration, and also Mirastia hatching. Uh, to genotype uh, the species of schistosome using the combination of ITS and COX-1 genotyping. Uh, hematuria and anemia were measured uh, for both years, uh, and ultrasonography was performed only in 2017, following the NIAMI protocol for both uh, um, urogenital and intestinal schistosomiasis. For this presentation, I will focus on the most interesting results uh, for school aged children in 2017 uh, pre treatment. We had uh, several morbidity indicators, such as hematuria and anemia, which are, were, had four categories. And we also had uh, a bladder and upper urinary tract scores following the lesions observed by ultrasonography. The uh, combination of both these scores gives a global score. We also had classification of the uh, bladder wall. And finally, we had hepatomegaly as determined by the measure of the left uh, liver lobe uh, by ultrasonography. We tried to find association between uh, risk factors such as uh, infection presence and intensity or presence of hybrids and schistosomiasis morbidity. Uh, however, instead of using the uh, most common simple logistic regression, which only models the presence or absence of a given morbidity indicator, we rather used cumulative link logistic regressions because we had mo many morbidity indicators that were that had different categories and were not just present absent. And this type of model allows to uh, integrate this information uh, and therefore improve the statistical power. As for a simple logistic regression, the results were expressed as odds ratios where an OR uh, above one means an increased risk, whereas an OR below one means a decreased risk. For this study, we were first interested in seeing the impact of intestinal and urogenital co-infections on morbidity, looking at the presence and intensity of exine stool and exine urine, as well as their interactions, while accounting for age, sex, and study site. Then we looked at the impact of hybrids by looking at the, the presence or absence of uh, hybrids between hematobium and bovis in the given individuals while accounting for other risk factors. And for this second analysis, we used a subset of individuals that had uh, genotyped myricidia. Now we'll talk uh, about the results. Um, the prevalence of urogenital schistosomiasis was higher in Richardson than in Bakaji and uh, intestinal schistosomiasis was only present in Richardson. Overall, more than 2,500 myracidia were genotyped for both ITS and COX-1, which allowed to determine the species, and 23.2% uh, of myracidia were classified as hybrids between uh, hematobium and bovis. Overall, the prevalence of hybrids was higher in Richardson than in Barkaji, and for intestinal schistosomiasis, only schistosoma monsonai was uh, detected. 
When we looked at the impact of presence and intensity of fluorescent metal trisomiasis on uh, our mobility indicators, we found uh, positive associations with uh, or are more in, of, with OR more than one for hematuria as well as uh, lesions of the urinary tract as uh, determined by ultrasonography. However, we found no effect on anemia and hepatomegaly. Uh, so we had this positive association which presents an intensity of low origin of schistosomiasis. Interestingly, we found a smaller impact uh, on upper urinary tract compared to a lower tract. And therefore we advocate to use uh, the intermediate scores rather than the uh, overall global score when uh, uh, doing the statistical analysis to have a more precise idea of what is going on. We also found an increased risk in boys compared to girls, which I didn't show here, and which could be due to uh, anatomical, physiological, and or immunological differences. And uh, given this difference between boys and girls, we uh, we, th we think it would, could be interesting to uh, also um, analyze the risk factor for genital morbidity, which was not uh, included in our uh, study protocol. When looking at uh, the impact of co-infections, we uh, ha only had a small tendency of having increased bladder lesions and bladder wall calcifications when both uh, urogenital and intestinal schistomyosis were present. However, this was not uh, statistically significant. Um, nonetheless, we found this slight tendency of having increased bladder mobility uh, for com co-infections compared to single urogenital infection, uh, which is consistent with previous studies. And uh, the small effect was probably due to the low prevalence of schistosomal mansona in our study uh, and in only one study site. Finally, the most interesting and uh, most novel results were that for uh, the impact of hybrids, we found an increased risk of having hepatomegaly and a decreased risk of having a uh, upper tract score. For the later, it was uh, not statistically significant, but when we looked separately at kidneys and ureters, we found a statistically significant effect of having a decreased risk of lesions in the ureters but no impact on the kidneys. Therefore, we had a differential mobility profiles for uh, hybrids as well, with this time increased hepatic mobility and decreased ureter lesions for uh, hybrids between hematobium and bovis compared to single hematobium infections, proving for the first time the potential impact of hybrids on morbidity in humans. This study should be published soon in the journal Microorganisms, and I would like to thank all the co-authors and all the people involved in the study, as well as the funders. I would also like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present these results today and all of you for your attention. Super. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was great. And we will come back to answer the questions at the end. So next, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Brigitta Nevelt from the University of Copenhagen. And she is going to present some of the work on severe persistent intestinal morbidity hotspots in the Lake Albertine region of Uganda. Thank you very much. And over to you, Brigitta. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Birgitte Wennerwald. I'm a professor at the University of Copenhagen, and I will be talking about severe persistent intestinal morbidity hotspots in the Lake Albertine region of Uganda. So if we start by looking at uh, morbidity of intestinal schistosomiasis, then uh, we have the worms located in the, around the intestines in the mesenteric veins. And when they excrete eggs, approximately 50% of the eggs will be trapped somewhere in the host tissue. This can either be in the liver or in the intestinal wall. And if we have several granulomas, because eggs trapped in the liver will cause a granuloma. So if we have several granulomas in the liver, this may lead to hepatosplenomegaly. And eventually, if it persists, we will get to what we call periportal fibrosis, as is shown here which is basically scar tissue forming around the little portal branches of the liver. 
Uh, I thought that I would start out by looking a little bit about the Shisusumasi's history in Uganda. And uh, if you look at this arrow, you can see that it starts 1903 and it ends 2003 when the Shisusumasi's uh, control initiative started in Uganda. Then the first detection of Shisusuma Mansonai took place in 1903. But this is not so much uh, what I want to focus on. I want actually to focus on the fact that in 1972, Uncom and Bradley published uh, what you could say was the first really detailed um, description of morbidity, schistosomiasis morbidity in Uganda. If you look at the bottom part, you can see that uh, what we use for detecting morbidity, namely the ultrasound and uh, the standardized way of, of scoring with the ultrasound came in 1985, where ultrasound was used and the standardized NIME protocol based on uh, some pattern scores, which was developed in actually a, a long late Albert, uh, was came up in 2001. Now, at the time of Ongum, uh, you would say, well, most of the research in schistosomiasis was conducted outside Sub-Saharan Africa. It was in Egypt, it was in South America, some of it in Asia. And definitely a lot of the morbidity related research was done on schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma diponicum. That means it was not really done on schistosoma mansonai. Um, and um, it was um, thought that severe disease associated with schistosoma mansonai was not actually observed among populations in sub Saharan Africa. It was seen in Brazil, it was seen for japonicum in Asia but not really in, in the Sub-Saharan Africa. And that when uh, Ongom and Bradley published their first paper, it was done in Panyagoro in Uganda. And uh, they had first a very solid epidemiology and they looked at the consequences of having an infection. And later on, they selected a group of people uh, they took to hospital and did a proper hospital investigation of a subgroup of people from Panyagoro community. And if you look at a map of Uganda, you can see that uh, the, the top arrow is pointing at Panyagoro and the bottom arrow, arrow is pointing at Hoima, where we are actually conducting studies and which I will tell you a little bit more about. Now, what Ongom uh, found out was that there was a very high level of histosoma mentona infection there was enlargement of liver and spleen. It was very common. Diarrhea with blood was seen, abdominal pain. And then he found ascites being a very common finding. Actually, 13 of his 235 patients showed severe ascites. Furthermore, anemia and eosinophilia and a number of the people he examined initially had died within two years uh, after the examination. And several of them he described as being very likely to have died from Bilharsia. And if we look at his data, we can see that he found definitely a very high prevalence. This is the, the solid line with the, with the closed circles. You can see that prevalence very rapidly reached almost 100% and quite high intensities as well. And he concluded that much of the disease was probably due to schistosoma mansonai, and in this community, it was clearly causing disease of public health importance. And you could say this was the first time that anybody really coined the fact that schistosoma mansonai was causing public health, disease of public health concern in sub-Saharan Africa. He also uh, found a number of patients with uh, abdominal swelling or ascites. And he said, or he concludes that ascites was a common finding. Now, uh, schistosomiasis uh, in Uganda um, has uh, led to uh, a launch of a control program in 2003, and that was a program aiming at controlling schistosomiasis and intestinal worms. And over the years, this has led to a significant reduction in disease and disease intensity countrywide. And it has also led to an increase in community awareness about causes and preventive measures for bilharsia. And uh, that's the case in most districts, but there are still some problems. And uh, some of the problems um, are in some of the areas I'm gonna talk about. 
there may be a poor medicine uptake due to fear of side effects. Uh, some of the micro migratory fishing communities have poor sanitary facilities. And in some areas, there have been an upsurge of mobility. And these are typically, these areas are typically islands of Lake Victoria and in the Albertine region, such as Hoima, Bulisa, Papuach districts. Now, in uh, October to December 2017, there was a, a survey or a, a monitoring uh, effort uh, taking place. And uh, that concluded that uh, the prevalence is still high in most places, it's 29%. It's highest in the children, young children, two to four years of age. And uh, these are children who are not normally treated under the MDA campaigns. It's also quite common in, among pregnant women and the risk of being positive after treatment is quite high. It's uh, amounting to 44%. And these are data I got from Frederick Makumbi and Simon Kibira uh, who conducted the, the monitoring exercise. So uh, despite the fact that there has been treatment with Prasoquantel since 2003, uh, health clinics are seeing an increase in people with portal hypertension and severe sites due to cystosomiasis, as you will see some of the pictures showing. And uh, this is uh, a sign of severe clinical morbidity in uh, the area around Lake Albert. And this cropped up uh, and was first uh, looked upon in 2016. And this is surprising, you could say, because uh, there has been MDA with Prasopontil, as I said, since 2003. Furthermore, you could say there's also been uh, an increasing number of uh, self-reported and reported hematemesis. And as you can see in the picture, a guy who goes to the local health clinic and actually has a, a bout of, of uh, hematemesis. So uh, severe disease, and this is seen not just in adults, it's seen both in children and adults. Uh, some of these patients shown here are children, uh, and uh, there's also some adults shown. And uh, this led to a survey among uh, the primary schools in Hoima district in 2007. And as you will see here, you can see that the blue bars are representing the prevalence of schistosoma mansoni. And it's very high, some areas it's 100% uh, almost. Some schools have a very low prevalence, but most schools have a reasonably high prevalence. If you look at the gray bars, you can see that the proportion of children excreting more than 399 eggs per gram of stool is also quite high in most areas. In some areas it's more than 70% and uh, in some schools it's less. But what is important is that if we look at severe fibrosis, which is the orange bar, then you can see that this ranges high in many of the schools. And here we are talking about primary schools, schools or an age group where we're not really expecting to see a lot of severe fibrosis. And in some of the schools, you will see that it amounts to almost 50% or maybe even more. I have put some arrows and that's uh, the two schools which were selected further for a research project, which I will talk about uh, later in the presentation. Now, if you look at a summary of the prevalence of periportal fibrosis, then you can see that the most common type is the type called C. And I've just put the WHO scoring sheet here. You can see that C is relatively mild peripheral fibrosis, but even the more, the more severe fibrosis, central fibrosis, uh, which is uh, classified as D, is quite prevalent. It's, um, I would say, 25% of the children. And the very severe forms is around 5%. So there's clearly a lot of fibrosis in these communities. And if you look at the association or the relationship between egg count, intensity of infection, and fibrosis score, then we see that there's a clear link between having high egg count and having severe fibrosis. The higher egg count you have, the more risk of severe fibrosis. This led to a research program because you could say what can then be done about this morbidity. Uh, a research program financed by the EDGTP European uh, program 
and uh, it's called impact of increased prosequential frequency of childhood fibrosis in persistent schistosomiasis morbidity hotspots. And it has a number of partners in, uh, it's coordinated by Dr. Shona Wilson from University of Cambridge. And it's got partners in several partners in UK and Uganda and uh, University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Now, the aim of this project is really to evaluate whether increasing the frequency of treatment with prosecontel and still using the school-based strategies will reduce prevalence of childhood periportal fibrosis in these morbidity hotspots. So it's instead of just having a single annual treatment, uh, we will try out with two times per year or four times per year with prosecontel treatment versus the standard annual treatment and see what impact that has on morbidity. And thank you very much for your attention. Super, thank you very much, Brigitte. That's great. And indeed, it's super to see so many quest, uh, questions coming in in the Q&A box too. Um, ideally, if you could please start um, to say who, who you're directing the question at for when we come back at the end. So now I'm delighted to pass over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Amy Sturt from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And here she's going to be talking about, again, as I said, a very neglected aspect, but becoming more and more pertinent nowadays, is to look at the implications and applications of both female and male genital schistosomiasis. So thank you very much and over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to present genital schistosomiasis, morbidity, diagnostics, and the road forward. Today I will explore the morbidity of genital schistosomiasis and how this differs from the standard morbidity assessed during standard and monitoring evaluation. Today, I'll discuss genital schistosomiasis definitions, evaluation for and diagnosis of genital schistosomiasis and genital schistosomiasis morbidity. Female genital schistosomiasis is caused when S. hematobium eggs are deposited in the genital tract and can be diagnosed by visualizing eggs in genital tissue, detecting S. hematobium DNA in genital secretions, or through characteristic clinical pathology. Likewise, male genital schistosomiasis is also caused by deposition of S. hematobium ova in the male genital tract and is often diagnosed by finding eggs in genital fluid and is characterized by symptoms such as pelvic pain and hematospermia. In 74 case reports, involved organs included the scrotum and testes, prostate, seminal vesicles, epididymis, and penis. But the remainder of this talk will focus primarily on female genital schistosomiasis. FGS is associated with sexual and reproductive tract morbidity. Symptoms characteristic of FGS have also been commonly associated with sexually transmitted infections, such as dysuria, abdominal pain, abnormal vaginal discharge, dyspareunia, and postcoital bleeding. Louisa Samuels, a master's student working with our study group, found that prosequantal treatment in Zambian women with FGS decreased female genital schistosomiasis associated symptoms at one year. Additionally, Another comorbidity associated with S. hematobium infection is infertility. Miller's fellows found that there was an association between the age at first antischistosomal treatment and later fertility in adulthood, with strong evidence that women treated for S. hematobium infection before the age of 21 were less likely to have subfertility. Schistosomiasis is a global disease of poverty with 779 million people estimated to be at risk for schistosoma infection. Additionally, modeling data suggests that 82 million African women are living with S. hematobium infection. HIV infection disproportionately affects women in Sub-Saharan Africa, and 38 million people worldwide are living with HIV infection, 54% of whom live in Eastern and Southern Africa. Cross-sectional studies have shown an association between S. hematobium and prevalent HIV-1, and there is evidence both for and against this association. Cross-study uh, comparisons are challenging because some studies evaluate FGS and others evaluate urinary S. hematobium. But again, even in the case of urinary S. hematobium, there's evidence both for and against the association with HIV. And clearly more research is needed to uh, answer this important question. 
The morbidity of genital schistosomiasis differs from the morbidity profiles assessed during standard monitoring and evaluation. Standard monitoring and evaluation often evaluate urinary schistosomiasis with the use of urine dipsticks for hematuria and proteinuria or urine microscopy. Some settings use the circulating anodic um, antigen to diagnose active schistosome infection. Additionally, sometimes abdominal ultrasound is used to assess genital, I'm sorry, urinary tract morbidity. Unfortunately, though, none of these modalities evaluate definitively for genital involvement. An FGS diagnosis, however, requires the evaluation of the female genital tract, um, either in visualization or sampling, in addition to standard monitoring and evaluation performed for urinary schistosomiasis. FGS is, diagnosis is challenging in part because um, cervical visualization and sampling often requires speculum insertion, um, and in part because there's not a defined reference standard. Sampling of the genital tissues, like genital bi like cervical biopsy, has been performed in some settings, but this um, there are some limitations to this technique, including that it requires equipment and training that may not be available in all endemic areas. Um, eggs can cluster in the cervix, causing false negative biopsies, and eggs can also be present in normal appearing tissue. Thus, commonly used surrogate techniques to diagnose FGS also include standard or portable colposcopy to visualize characteristic FGS-associated lesions, or PCR or RPA for um, detection of schistosoma DNA in genital specimens. Due to the challenges in diagnosis in female genital schistosomiasis, there is an information gap. We suspect 82 million women are living with S. hematobium infection, but in the published literature, there are only 12,000 documented um, FGS cases approximately. There's also a treatment gap. Proxyclontal 40 milligrams per kilogram is the currently recommended FGS therapy, but studies performed in Tanzania and Zimbabwe have shown that FGS lesions do not uniformly resolve with this treatment. Thus, there are a number of gaps in the FGS field that need further research, including epidemiology, diagnostics, immunopathology, treatment, comorbidities, and policy. With the time remaining, I'll int introduce you briefly to the work our study group has undertaken in Zambia and Malawi to try to fill these knowledge and research gaps. Between January and August 2018, female participants in the population cohort of the previous HIV prevention trial, HPTN071 Popart, were recruited to participate in the cross-sectional bilharzia and HIV or relief study. A thousand, sorry, 1,104 women provided an expression of interest and 603 women were enrolled. They were eligible if, to participate if they were 18 to 31 years old, previously sexually active, not pregnant, and resident in one of two communities that participated in HPTN 071 Popart in Livingston, Zambia. A community worker performed home visits, and these home visits included a questionnaire, genital self-sampling, both cervical and vaginal swabs, and a single urine specimen. Enrolled women who are not currently menstruating were invited to attend the cervical cancer screening clinic where one of two trained midwives performed a cervical vaginal lavage and portable colposcopy. This work showed a sensitivity, and a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 100% when vaginal and cervical swab PCR were compared with any positive genital PCR as the reference standard. This study was a proof of concept. Um, to explore whether the performance of genital self-testing would be feasible and acceptable. We also found that the proportion of participants testing positive with any um, PCR-positive genital specimen decreased with the increasing age. The assured criteria specified that diagnosis, diagnostics for tropical infectious diseases should be affordable, sensitive, specific, user-friendly, rapid, equipment-free, and delivered at all levels of the healthcare system. We can debate about whether the PCR or the visual diagnosis of FGS fulfill a few additional criteria than what is ticked here, but clearly they are not the solution for FGS diagnostics going forward. Thus, we've been um, very honored to partner with colleagues at the Natural History Museum who are really doing a lot of work to move the recombinase polymerase assay forward. Um, our colleagues at the Natural History Museum are using the RPA assay, which uses low temperature isothermal reaction, requires minimal equipment, and takes less time to carry out than traditional PCR. In addition, the RPA can be performed using lyophilized reagents, and so it is much more feasible for use at the point of care in endemic areas. 
that targets the schistosome, the hematobium, draw one genomic region, and the data on the RPA are being prepared for publication. So please watch this space for further details. Our study group has been working hard to try to close some of the existing knowledge gaps around FGS and comorbidities as well. Uh, this study uh, evaluating HIV incidence in FGS was recently published in Open Forum Infectious Diseases, as well as this work in um, BMC ID uh, regarding FGS and cervical dysplasia. Um, with, I'd like to also introduce uh, work that has recently taken place in Malawi and that will be upcoming in Zambia. Uh, the work in Malawi is in memoriam to Dr. Ingerwa. The Malawi study was nested within Morbid with the aim to quantify morbidity across schistosoma endemic settings. Two S hematobium endemic settings in Malawi uh, uh, were evaluated, and women from the Morbid main study were surveyed for female genital schistosomiasis. Data collection occurred from November 2020 to May 2021, and women 16 to 65 years old attended clinic and were seen by a midwife who performed genital swabs cervical vaginal lavage, and used two different handheld colposcopes to identify FGS-associated lesions. 1,050 women were surveyed, and currently data analysis of the PCR and images are underway. There will also be some upside, upcoming, exciting upcoming work um, in Zambia regarding uh, self-testing. The vision of the study is to, about, to create and to evaluate an integrated approach to the diagnosis of genital tract infections and, and access to care, um, acknowledging the complex interplay between FGS, HIV, HPV, cervical cancer, and uh, sexually transmitted infections. The study will follow a longitudinal cohort of 3,000 women who will receive integrated self-sampling. It will also investigate the effects of prosequantal treatment on morbidity, a health economics um, evaluation to ensure sustainability, um, and the interplay of FGS, cervical cancer, HIV, and STIs will be evaluated, as well as further attention to immunopathology. Uh, in conclusion, FGS negatively affects the sexual and reproductive health of girls and women. Uh, Community-based diagnostics using self-swabs are feasible and acceptable, and it is at least as good as clinic-based diagnostics. FGS morbidity is preventable with MDA, but the optimal uh, treatment is not known and FGS is very likely associated with other comorbidities, um, but evidence is scared and further scarce and further research um, is needed. I'd like to acknowledge our many collaborators and thank you for your attention today. Wonderful, thank you very much, Amy. So now we're gonna to go to the last talk of this webinar before I have time to touch on some of the questions to each of the speakers. So I'm delighted now to hand you over to Professor Alison Elliott from the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, who's going to talk, follow on very nicely from Amy's and talk about some of the implications and applications of schistosomiasis in pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about schistosomiasis in pregnancy. Of 240 million people with schistosomiasis in the world, about 40 million are women of reproductive age. This presentation builds on a review uh, undertaken together with Jennifer Friedman and others, and on work conducted by my team in Uganda, whom I acknowledge, and by Jennifer's team and colleagues in the Philippines, whom I acknowledge also. <clears throat> As a disclaimer, my own interest in helminth infections arose from a background in tuberculosis and interest in why BCG vaccine doesn't work well in the tropics. This figure from Paul Fine's work shows how vaccine efficacy for BCG ranges from 81% in temperate regions to uh, zero in the equatorial regions. And now more broadly, uh, to population differences in immunological responses as illustrated by this uh, work using mass cytometry, uh, which mapped the responses of different cell types in Africans and Europeans. And the diagrams show through their colors how different the profiles of different uh, cell lineages are between the two settings. Our work on schistosomiasis hotspots has been in the villages of the Lake Victoria Islands, and we undertook a cluster randomized 
uh, trial of intensive treatment uh, quarterly with quarterly prasequantil versus standard treatment for three years. And comparing baseline uh, prevalence using catacats with um, standard treatment, you can see that there was very little change in the overall profile. And using the more sensitive methods such as urine CCA, most people remained uh, infected. In the intensive arm, the, intensive, the intensity of infection was reduced, but the prevalence remained high. And these panels highlight the ages uh, of reproductive age for women. So why treat schistosomiasis in pregnancy and during breastfeeding? <clears throat> well, first of all, for inclusion of the women in mass drug administration campaigns, uh, because women of reproductive uh, age who are breastfeeding and pregnant have similar susceptibility to general schistosomiasis morbidities to colleagues of the same age. There may be specific benefits too in pregnancy, such as for maternal anemia and nutrition, and specific benefits for reproductive health, uh, especially for schistosoma hematobium in terms of fe female genital schistosomiasis and perhaps HIV susceptibility. For the baby, there might be benefits for birth weight, a building on the new improved maternal nutrition for infant iron status and hemoglobin and for other fetal outcomes and for postnatal infant immune responses. Prasequantal is the only drug widely available for this, uh, released in 1979 as a class B drug uh, known to be non teratogenic in animals, but not tested in humans. And manufacturers' recommendations still include avoidance in pregnancy and delay in breastfeeding for 72 hours after treatment. But WHO consultations and guidelines uh, have recommended inclusion of pregnant and breastfeeding women in mass drug administration uh, based on, uh, on observations over the 20 years of use, uh, but randomized trials recommended for safety and efficacy studies in pregnancy, and two such trials have now been conducted. Our trial in Uganda was designed to understand effects of mass drug administration on vaccine responses in infancy, and we compared prasequantile 40 milligrams with placebo and albendazole with placebo in a two by two factorial trial in 2,500 women enrolled in the second and third trimesters, of whom 18% turned out to have schistosomiasis. We achieved a substantial reduction in schistosoma positivity, but no benefit for birth weight, maternal anemia. Thankfully, no effect on congenital abnormalities or perinatal mortality, and also no effect on infant vaccine responses. Philippines trial targeted women identified as infected with schistosoma japonicum with 60 milligrams per kilogram of prasequantile in a divided dose versus placebo and enrolled women in their first trimester, most of whom had light infections. They also achieved a substantial reduction in infection rates, but no benefits for birth weight, maternal anemia, and no effects on uh, congenital abnormalities and other fetal outcomes. They also looked at uh, pharmacokinetics in early, late pregnancy and in postpartum women, and found the area under the curve was lower in the women in early pregnancy, but, uh, but still higher than in children given the same dose in whom uh, this level was found to be effective. So no change in dose recommended. For breastfeeding, they looked at levels in breast milk and calculated that the estimated dose a child was, would receive would be tiny compared to a therapeutic dose and that a negligible concentration was still present uh, by 24 hours, so the 72-hour recommendation was not required. So the results of the trials support the WHO recommendations, as do subsequent uh, observation on case studies, and now 30 years of post-marketing surveillance. And we recommend that pregnant and breastfeeding women should be treated during mass drug administration. Lactating women don't need to delay breastfeeding after treatment and individuals identified as having schistosomiasis when pregnant or breastfeeding can be treated. 
What are the effects of sensitization of the infant on the uh, infant immune response? Sensitization of infants and potential role of, of antibodies in this have long been uh, recognized and discussed, as well as effects uh, on subsequent schistosomiasis disease and unrelated vaccine responses. And in the Uganda study, uh, Robert Twayanjari looked at treatment in pregnancy and its effects on the response, the schistosome specific response in the mothers. And he showed uh, here with the examples of antibody responses to schistosome worm antigen, no change in responses uh, in the placebo treated mothers, but the expected boost in responses uh, in the prasequantile treated mothers. So what implications does this have for the children? In the Uganda trial, we looked at children at five years. Only a few had schistosomiasis at that age, and there was no effect of maternal treatment uh, on the children's susceptibility to schistosoma infection, and no consistent effect uh, of maternal treatment on the infant's schistosome-specific responses. Similarly, in the Philippines, they looked at children at six years, again, very few infected, but no evidence of an effect of the maternal uh, treatment on the schistosomiasis infection. Uh, some evidence in this study of a more pro-inflammatory response to schistosome antigens in children whose mothers received praziquantel. But both studies with small numbers of infected children and light infections in many of the mothers, and for comparability, mothers in the two studies treated at different stages of pregnancy. In terms of effects on unrelated vaccine responses, this is a figure from the early study by Malhotra and colleagues who showed that infants who were sensitized in utero to worm antigens had uh, reduced gamma interferon and increased IL-5 responses to their BCG vaccination. But in the Uganda trial, we found no effect of praziquantel on infant BCG responses or on other infant vaccine responses. So why might this be? Well, perhaps sensitization in utero is not the same as uh, infection, and praziquantel itself may have resulted in some uh, changes in sensitization of the fetus. Also, may, there may have been irreversible effects of schistosome exposure such as training of innate immune responses. We did, however, see an effect of presequantile treatment of the mothers on, in, on the infant uh, rates of eczema, uh, with more than double the rates of eczema in the children of mothers who were treated. And this was restricted to the children of mothers who had schistosomiasis. So this was a worry in terms of uh, the potential long-term effects on allergy outcomes. Possible me mechanisms include a cross-reactive response in the adaptive response sensitized to schistosome antigens were resulting in a response to allergens or an effect on the innate uh, response altering the fetal res responses to promote uh, pro-allergic responses. <clears throat> we, so we followed up to see whether this uh, related to subsequent allergy outcomes and found, uh, fortunately, that uh, rates of allergic disease were very rare in the older children, and there was no effect of maternal prosequentel on these outcomes. In a recent uh, latent class analysis, we've seen that profiles of subsequent infection exposure characterized by malaria in infancy and the child's own schistosoma infection at older ages protected against allergy-related outcomes. And this brings me back to the thought of the effects of a constellation of in infections increasing recognition that prenatal exposures may drive both individual and population differences in, uh, in immunological responses. So in conclusion, maternal schistosomiasis impacts an infant response to schistosome antigens and unrelated antigens and prasequantal treatment in pregnancy may have a modest pro-inflammatory effect on subsequent schistosome-specific responses and increases eczema in Ugandan children, but without a long-term uh, effect on allergy-related disease. This long-term effect might be different in a setting with less exposure to infections in later life. So I leave you with a hypothesis. 
that exposure to schistosomiasis in utero is one of a constellation of infection exposures in early life that shape individual and population immunological profiles with important consequences for susceptibility to infectious and immunological, immunologically mediated diseases. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alison. Now, we are absolutely inundated in questions, which is brilliant um, from our sort of over 180 people here. So what I'm going to do for haste is I'm just going to go through speaker by speaker with specific questions and keep going back until we run out of time. And then we'll also give you each of the speakers our um, email addresses so you can contact them directly. So if we start with Sebastian. Awali Salami says, thank you very much. How would you explain isolated uretrine uh, lesions? Um, well, I was not sure exactly what was meant by isolated uretric lesions. Okay, so given, maybe... given the lack of time, <laughs> just I will just go to another one, which you partly answered directly as well as, how different is S. bovis myricidia from the schistosoma mantini and hematobium? And can you elaborate how much you differentiate between morphology or what techniques you used here or we used here? Uh, well, differentiation was made uh, based on the genotyping of uh, both DNA uh, ITS marker and the mitochondrial COX-1. So it was really based on uh, yeah, genotyping of myricidia here. And Joan can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we can differentiate uh, either uh, myricidia or eggs based on morphology, maybe eggs, but. Yeah, we can certainly differentiate the eggs, but not the myricidia. And interestingly, the hybrid ones have a kind of hybrid between the sort of terminal and lateral spine, but it's not exact. So yes, everything here that Sebastian has presented has been molecularly typed. Thank you. I'll come back to you Thank in a you. minute. But for now, Brigitte. Um, ooh. So from Habtuma Malakis. Uh, Dear Professor, does schistosoma mansoni infection occur as an outbreak in a community? And is a community screening possible or feasible? Thank you. So uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, we see it, but not in every community. So where we typically see uh, what we could call outbreaks or, or these, these upsurge of morbidity would be in very heavily exposed communities such as fishing communities. And uh, this would be typical along the big lakes or along uh, maybe the river Nile. And uh, you could say, is screening possible? I would say yes. Uh, that could be a, a definitely a possibility. I mean, a very simple thing would be if if uh, one wanted to establish the, the magnitude of the problem would be to figure out or just to ask health centers, do you see any people uh, referred here or coming on, on their own with hematemesis? Okay, super. I will now go to Alison, quickly, and we're coming back to all of them. There's so many good questions. Fantastic presentation, Professor Elliot. Is in the mums, did you know whether any mums had acute infection and was there any difference in pediatric outcomes associated with the mother's age or parity? So that's for Alison. If we've got Alison here. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I hadn't seen that question actually. <laughs> so, um, um, sorry, I've kind of lost track of it. Can you say it again? What the okay. question you want me to look at? So sorry. In, in relation, was there any difference in relation to whether the mums had sort of quite acute chisto, um, but any difference associated to the mother's age or parity associated with the outcomes? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, we wouldn't have really known whether the mothers had acute schistosomiasis. I mean, it's an endemic setting and they're adults. And so <clears throat> the chances are they've had it for a long time, but they certainly weren't showing sort of symptoms of acute schistosomiasis. So we weren't really in a position where we could address that. Um, and yeah, I don't recall any uh, specific effects of age and parity. Of course, it was a trial, so those things were balanced between the trial arms. So 
no special associations there. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll ask one for Amy on these super new diagnostics. Enoch Berteng has noted that many of these highly sensitive diagnostics are quite expensive to be adopted in the clinics and health facilities within these endemic areas. So what are your thoughts on how ABLE would be able to extend these molecular diagnostics and how beneficial will they actually be in terms of the elimination of schisto um, if their practical adoption is limited by finance? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question and that's an important, that's a really important point. I think that's where the RPA is really going to be able to shine over the um, PCR as the, it, there will be an investment in the machine that's needed to read and process the samples, but it's, it, it is, um, it is, it is much, it will be much cheaper than, than the PCR uh, making steps towards uh, accessibility uh, in endemic areas. Super, thank you, Amy. And it's two o'clock. Am I allowed to ask the speakers one question more each? I'll go ahead. <laughs> Sebastian, a great topic for which obviously we're doing. Um, Evidiscus Bakuba has asked, is there any need of having schistosomiasis treatment campaigns for the animals, the domestic animals? Um, so there is a cycle uh, between animals and humans uh, based on the presence of these hybrids. So uh, this is working, yeah, something we need to work on, I think, uh, that uh, is it needed to interrupt the cycle of transmission and uh, is uh, the animal playing a role of reservoir of uh, transmission of schistosomiasis? to humans, which could uh, yeah, prevent uh, elimination in some areas. So uh, I would not say how it is definitely needed, but uh, yeah, some work it needs to be done. On, and that, on and that indeed is something we're looking at from very much in terms of the animal, the morbidity of the animals. We've seen in this presentation, the morbidity of the humans. This is not a nice disease for the animals anyway, and people are treating them. So that's a whole other story. Yeah. Quickly over to uh, Brigitte. Um, a big question. So is the severity due to host genetic background or to the parasite genetic background? Oh dear, that's a good <laughs> question. And I would say it's probably due to a little bit of both. Uh, the gen parasite genetic background is something Joanne Webster and her team is, will be looking into in this Fibershop project. And the host genetic background, I mean, it's very likely to be a combination. So it's very likely to have something to do with the parasite, maybe also something to do with the host genetics, and maybe a lot of things we don't even know about, which could be the, the pressure of transmission. I mean, a really intense transmission may lead to, to higher levels of mobility. What I can say is that, that the, there have been some studies trying to look into genetic background and to some extent found some markers which were related to severe mobility. Uh, but uh, to say that that's the only the only factor playing a role, I think is is uh, probably too much. Yep, super. Thank you. And we'll just slip in a last one, hopefully, from Poppy Lamberton to Alison. Thank you for a great talk. With the increase in eczema in children from mothers with schisto who had prosequantal, what was the rate of eczema in children born to mothers? Uh, schisto and other STH are negative without treatment? And was this higher or lower than the children from schisto infected mothers and those treated? Yes, I was so just typing something for that question and I found it a little bit complicated. But <laughs> basically, in terms of observational analyses, the, the worms were generally protective against eczema. Um, the rate in the rate in mothers with schisto who weren't treated was about was less than half the rate in mothers with schisto who were treated uh, but in some of the effects were even more prominent for hookworm which was actually more common in the cohort and so with greater power um, and the albendazole treatment also resulted in increased rates of eczema but having hookworm uh, sort of protected from the adverse effects of treatment. So, so I think on the whole, 
the message is that um, maternal helminth infection uh, is protective against eczema in the children and that the treatment in the case of schistosomiasis uh, caused quite a dramatic but mercifully short-lived effect. Okay, thank you very much. There are so many more questions that we'd really love to discuss, but I am being stopped. So just to say that, you know, these questions, the whole um, meeting recorded and with the questions and answers will go live on the London Centre um, website from next week. And as I said, please do feel free to ask any further questions and also to the people directly. Uh, because it's clearly such a fascinating topic. And I think for our next webinar, we'll have more time for the questions and discussions. But I'd just like to say thank you so much to all of you for taking part and to our four absolutely superb speakers. So on behalf of everybody, thank you. Thank you very much.